We'll make a start. Uh, I'm Field Rickards. This is the fifth of the Dean's Lecture Series in the Graduate School of Education. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we're holding tonight's lecture. And I pay respect of the Elders, both past and present of the Kulin Nation, and to all Indigenous Australians present here tonight. Tonight's Dean's Lecture is being presented by an, exception, an exceptional Indigenous Australian, Professor Ian Anderson, and I'll say more about Ian in a minute. The esteem in which Ian is held is reflected by your attendance, an attendance that reflects diverse communities across the university and beyond. There are some people I wish to particularly acknowledge. I acknowledge Mr Robert Grew, Associate Secretary for Higher Education Re Research and International in the Commonwealth Department of Education. Also, Professor Marcia Langdon, who's, I think, known to all here. Uh, I also wish to acknowledge uh, Ms Ida Ritchie, who is a member of the University Council, uh, and welcome to all of you. So at the conclusion of, jo of Ian's presentation, I've asked Robert Grew to make some closing comments and also move a vote of thanks. And Robert, thank you for accepting that invitation. You'll then be inv invited to join me and others out in the foyer for some light refreshments. So now I'd like to introduce Ian. He is the Pro Vice Chancellor Engagement and Foundation Chair for Indigenous Higher Education at the University of Melbourne. He occupied the University's Foundation Chair for Indigenous Health and played a leadership role in the various iterations of the Cooperative Research Centre for Aboriginal and Luitja Institute until 2012. Professor Anderson chaired the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Equality Council from 2008 to 2012. And in 2012 was appointed co-chair of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Higher Education Council. Ian's background is in medicine and social sciences and he's worked in Aboriginal health for more than 25 years as a health worker, an educator, general practitioner, a policymaker and an academic. He's written widely on Indigenous health and, and development and maintains an active research portfolio. Ian's qualifications include an MBBS from 1989 from this university, PhD from La Trobe, and an honorary Doctor of Medical Science at the University of Melbourne. He's also a fellow of the Australian Faculty of Public Health Manage Medicine. Ian, I am delighted that you accepted my invitation to give a public lecture here in the Graduate School of Education. And tonight's lecture, as you can see, is entitled Indigenous Australians and Universities Navigating Reform in a Changing Land Landscape. Will you please welcome Ian to the front. So uh, thank you, Field, for that welcome. Um, Pankana Ian Anderson, Palawa Troana, Pai Marana, Troawalawe, Plamam Marana, University of Melbourne. Katumada Mine Warandri Tiana Kanemine Nena Nika Lenena. It is the protocol of Aboriginal people of this country to pay respect to our traditional custodians of country. And I do this on behalf of Mum's people and her ancestral clan groups, which I've just named. We honour the custodians of this place and the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We honour their ancestors and their Narangeta or their clan leaders. And I pay my respect to Aboriginal peoples of the country of Nam, this place which we're on. The Bunurung, uh, who share the country of Birurung, the Yarra River, the Watharung west of, uh, beyond the Werribee River, the Jaja Warung and the Changwarung people of central Victoria. And I acknowledge our elders and our community. I'd like to begin tonight to, by sharing a challenge that I've been working on with some colleagues over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, we have set out to try and build a cohort of Aboriginal graduates in engineering. Now today there are only still a handful of Indigenous engineers in Australia. Yet for over a decade now, a number of companies, including several in the mining industry and beyond, 
have invested in initiatives such as the Australian Indigenous Engineers Summer School to promote uh, engineering to Aboriginal secondary school students. And at last, there are some signs that we are starting that, to make an impact in terms of both uh, enrolments across all Australian universities, which have been trending up over the last decade, and uh, completions which are trending up but at a slower pace than enrolments. So, but the flow of Indigenous students into science, technology, engineering, and particularly uh, mathematics courses is still very weak, with engineering being a particular challenge as this discipline requires competencies in quite sophisticated mathematics. So why have industries such as the mining industries and others been so supportive and interested in this educational pathway? And why have I and my colleagues in the tertiary sector been so exercised by the challenge of increasing uh, the number of Indigenous students in engineering courses? Fundamentally, this priority has emerged because the mining industry in particular has realised that there is a robust business case uh, for the employment of Indigenous people across the whole employment spectrum, including uh, professionals such as engineers. This is largely because Indigenous employment and the procurement of Indigenous business is now one of the conditions around which contemporary agreements between native title holders and the mineral resource sector are based. And as these agreements have matured, there is a growing awareness across both the industry but also native title sector more broadly that a focus on entry level employment uh, alone is insufficient. Indigenous graduates with professional qualifications are needed in order to grow the number of Indigenous employees in middle to senior management and across the business and services sector. The realisation of social benefits of mining in these regions requires the development of an Indigenous professional workforce who can take the industry's management positions, the engineers, the accountants and the lawyers who can work with Indigenous corporations managing the mining royalties, or the doctors and nurses working for the programs created through the benefits invested uh, uh, through um, mining royalties. I would be overstating the case to say that Indigenous engineers are fundamental to the social contract of the mining industry is establishing with Indigenous Australia. However, they are in indicative of the sort of investment we need to be thinking about for in human capital needed to realise the social and economic benefits to Indigenous Australians in these communities. They also provide a lens to some of the challenges that we need to think about in order to reshape the educational landscape across the school system and with the, within universities to achieve this goal. We've been thinking about this problem for a number of years in terms of opening up access to Indigenous students into another challenging professional area, medical education. <coughs> uh, the first four Aboriginal doctors graduated from Australian medical schools during the 1980s. But by 2012, the medical deans of Australia and New Zealand reported that the intake of first-year Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander medical students in Australian universities had reached a new high of 2.5%, reaching parity for the first time. This in itself is quite a significant increase from uh, 2005 when the number was 0.8%. The growing cohort of Aboriginal doctors are now making an impact on Indigenous health landscapes through their role in policy development, medical teaching and learning, the broader education of health professions and leadership in research, and they contribute to health practice in Indigenous and mainstream services. And this is a story that's been replicated across a whole range of health professional groups, including physiotherapy. This has not come about by accident. It is the culmination of nearly two decades of strategic investment in the Aboriginal health workforce, which has created an enabling policy environment and leadership across the health industry, including the medical professional bodies. Advocacy by Indigenous graduates has been important for a galvanising change, as has been the leadership shown uh, by medical deans. But the medical deans had to be brought to the table through this uh, persistent advocacy. Initially, this was developed through their engagement 
in a, a national curriculum framework for Indigenous health, which later led to accreditation standards, which are now applied to all medical schools uh, across the country in terms of uh, Indigenous health. Ultimately, it was the deans who were, became responsible for driving local change in universities and to ensure that we can report on the success to date. These two examples give a little lens into some of, I think, both the incredible challenges but also the incredible importance of Indigenous higher education. Many Indigenous communities have been able to articulate a clear vision for their cultural and political autonomy. This is evident in the development of new local and regional structures to strengthen decision making and make cultural authority real at a community level. There's also a strong aspiration though in many Aboriginal Indigenous communities to participate in the broader economy. This has been expressed in a number of ways. A, a desire for jobs, a freedom for reliance on government welfare or government program funding, the creation of greater opportunities for Indigenous business. This will not occur without the economic, intellectual and political ca capital which is needed for innovation, for a creativity and business startup, or the ability to create a policy environment needed for change. Higher education is critical to realising this vision for economic development. It is critical for the broader vision of cultural and social development. Now by focusing on cohorts of Indigenous graduates and professionals, <coughs> I do not want to reduce the purpose of higher education to purely just an instrumental function. Higher education provides the means to realise the potential talent and creativity with Indigenous Australia. Such creativity and innovation draws on a broad range of disciplines that includes the humanities, the performing arts, science and business. But higher education is critical to seeing how we build an economy and build Indigenous development. The reason why I'm labouring this point is because for a long time it hasn't been important to Indigenous education strategy. It's been the, the go-to point when we realise our educational ambitions. In the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Education Plan 2010, the importance of higher education was noted, but there was no specific strategies to achieving pathways into university education. And this is reflective of the kind of thinking that I think pervades some of our thinking around universities, that it's the boutique end. It's the bit we get to. Yet I actually see it as critical to enabling change and, uh, and development. This policy gap was addressed in 2012 with the review of higher education access and outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The first comprehensive review of Indigenous higher education. The scope of the review covered student pathways, Indigenous <coughs> research, teaching and learning, and the organisational reforms needed to deliver outcomes. Tonight I'm not going to deal with the breadth of this comprehensive reform agenda laid out in the review. I'll be focusing on two things. Firstly, shifting the debate on participation to ensure a greater emphasis on achieving high quality outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. And secondly, broadening the access to a greater range of disciplines. Both these issues recept, uh, are a significant challenge, but both are vital if we to realise the, the productivity potential of Indigenous students by being able to make them be able to be competitive for the best graduate opportunities than the best jobs that are out there. However, before we go on, I want to lay out some of the key challenges. Uh, in Indigenous higher education, we need to be mindful uh, that our Indigenous reform agenda is being prosecuted at a time when financing of Indigenous higher education system is undergoing a fundamental transformation. The reforms announced in the 2014 budget are to be in place by 1 January 2016. These microeconomic reforms have become enmeshed with the broader budget strategy of cost reduction, but they include several things that are going to be quite relevant to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. The removal on caps for a domestic student contribution. Uh, universities will be allowed to set fees at any level they deem appropriate. However, 20% of additional fee revenue has been uh, set aside for student equity and merit scholarships that are administered by universities. The caps will be removed on the higher education the, the higher education loans program. 
postgraduate uh, Commonwealth scholarships uh, supported places will be reviewed later this year. And caps will also be removed from the enrolment of some bachelor places, uh, the associate de uh, degrees and the pre-bachelor degrees. For the first time, non-university and private providers will be able to provide uh, access to Commonwealth funding for these, uh, these levels of degree. I'll come back to a number of these uh, issues as we progress through our conversation. But it's also important to note that there'll be a number of uh, program funding cuts. The most relevant to Indigenous tertiary strategy includes cuts to the, the HEP program, which will be redes redesigned, and the research training scheme, which will include a new set, uh, new student contribution. Now, prior to the budget, uh, Minister Pine uh, restated the current gov uh, government's ongoing commitment to Indigenous and broader equity strategy. Whilst there's still uncertainty about how these issues will play out uh, in the Senate, and anyone who can read that one is doing a good job, um, <coughs> it, is unlikely that, it is likely that the key elements uh, will remain intact. Regardless, we will need to find a way to navigate this really important Indigenous reform agenda in a changing landscape, and this is going to be some of the substance of the issues that I want to just briefly touch on tonight. I will now lay out the key challenges that confront Indigenous participation in the higher education sector and also reflect on the adjustments that we need to make in order to maintain a reform agenda within the broader changing landscape. In 2013, there were 13, uh, just over 13,000 Indigenous students enrolled in uh, higher education institutions. With about 6,000 of them commencing their tertiary studies this year. With numbers such as these, we've come a very long way from the days that I actually remember when it was unusual to have an Aboriginal student at university. We are looking at a nearly 50% of increase in enrolments over the last decade. Growth is uh, particularly marked in terms of undergraduate programs, the top line, but also the, the, the red line uh, growing in postgraduate enrolments, which have doubled over this period of time. But although the, the demand for, uh, for places by Indigenous students in the higher education system has continued to grow in absolute numbers, the relative proportions remain largely unchanged. Now, the, this graph kind of stretches it out. It's only a 0.15% difference over the last uh, 10 years to 2013. We will need to push harder to shift this, and proportional representation is a very important measure, particularly if we are to realise the benefits to society of broadening economic opportunity for Indigenous Australians. Because we need to be, in order to improve the economic position of Indigenous Australia, we need to change the compositional structure in terms of the numbers of people in the community who have graduate degrees and who have uh, postgraduate degrees. And this won't occur if we're still significantly lagging what's happening in the broader Australian community. There, is, there are some good news in terms of increasing enrolments. One of the concerns that has been released, uh, arranged uh, in relation to the potential impact of fee de deregulation is the effect that it might have on Indigenous participation rates. Now to date, the cost of a university degree does not seem to have an impact negatively on demand for uh, places. Uh, among students more generally. However, I would caution to say we can't be so cavalier as to assume that there are not future tipping points. That at some point, cost might matter. We need to closely monitor the demand for places by Indigenous students as the deregulation de agenda rolls out. In a deregulated system, students are recast as consumers. However, prospective students make decisions of significant life consequence without necessarily having all the experience to equip, fully equip them to make this choice. Such decisions have an impact on future job prospects. And what is important to me is that there is a social gradient at play here. Aboriginal students don't have the advantage of the networks that assist their advantaged peers in making these decisions. Strategies are required to build a social infrastructure that provides students with the best possible advice. At the age of 17, I barely knew what an engineer was, and no one in my family had been to university. So we're actually now asking 
future students to make life, life, uh, big life decisions uh, and we need to make sure that they've got the tools and resources to make those decisions. Students need more than career planning and, and particularly at a university level they need high quality internship experiences particularly for those undergraduate degrees that have no clearly uh, defined professional focus. Decisions made by young people particularly become important as we shift onto them the future debt burden for their education. In thinking this through though, it's not just coming to university, it's actually leaving university with a degree that is important. Completions are critical to ensuring graduate outcomes, that goes without saying. And this is particularly the case as we know that there is some evidence out there uh, that if you leave university without uh, completing your degree, you're slightly worse off than if you just left at year 12. And that for very complex reasons about your entry into the labour market. So the issue of attrition or leaving is particularly important. Despite growth in uh, completion, and here we, again we see uh, good news over the last decade in terms of the number of uh, completions, However, outcomes are significantly lagging behind that of non-Indigenous students. In this particular analysis, uh, which was undertaken by the department uh, this year, is particularly revealing. This actually tracks forward the completions of a particular cohort. And what it shows that of the cohorts starting in 2005, only 40% of Indigenous students have completed. That's fully nearly 30 percentage points lower than their non-Indigenous peers. Although Indigenous Australians are much more likely to be in uh, and still enrolled at the end of the six year uh, cohort period. This for me is very, is particularly concerning uh, in terms of the ability of people to actually get jobs as a benefit of their uh, higher education. Um, success rates also, um, and so success rates in a number of units passed divided by the number of units attempted. Now, I won't expect you to be able to uh, read through the detail of this, but basically it shows that for non-Indigenous, uh, sorry, for Indigenous students across nearly all disciplines have remained ra remarkably constant over the last decade. So we have a major challenge here. We have a challenge in terms of completion rates and a challenge in improving success at university. Now the reasons for the relatively poorer completions for Indigenous students are complex and we don't yet have the data and the analytical frameworks to really answer these questions in a sophisticated way. However, I'd like to make a number of observations. Firstly is that there are some differences in the age cohort for Aboriginal Australians compared to non-Aboriginal Australians across universities and this is data uh, from the health sciences but it's absolutely mapped onto all disciplines so we have uh, significant gaps in the school leaver cohort with parity in the mature age co cohort, in fact more than parity in the mature age cohort which suggests that as Aboriginal people are coming, they're coming into higher education at a later age. Now the reason why this might impact on completions is that because once you come into university the age of 35, you also bring with you a whole bunch of other responsibilities and challenges that impact on your ability to actually complete your degree. The patterns of enrolment are vary between institutions with some having relatively smaller cohorts and higher completion rates while other have larger cohorts and lower completion rates with some with a mixed pattern. Nationally we also know from the uh, surveys of student engagement that whilst Indigenous students report that they are actually equally engaged in the university study, that is they want to be there, they want to study, they're also much more likely to, than their non-Indigenous peers to be thinking about or contemplating uh, leaving. Now whilst we don't have good, uh, uh, good comparative data on relative attainment, how well people are doing at year 12, we do have uh, quite a, a rich set of data in terms of how Aboriginal kids are travelling compared to their non-Indigenous peers in mid-secondary school. Now these are two graphs uh, that are put together from outcomes of a uh, program of assessment called PISA that's done in mid-secondary school. And you have uh, both in terms of maths and science but it's also the same 
for le reading literacy. Um, if you can read these graphs, you have indigenous, non-indigenous, and then in the top one, the OECD average. Now, the, the bit of the graph that I actually want to draw your attention to, whoops, is this bit. What this is showing is that <coughs> on a population average, our kids, the best of our kids, are significantly behind the best non-Indigenous kids. Now, that is significant when you come to year 12 and actually enrol in a university degree. Now, the reason why this is so concerning to me and the, is that because we're not doing enough about this in our education strategy. We're very concerned and we should be, and we absolutely should be concerned about those kids who are disengaging, who are falling behind but we have absolutely no strategy that's addressing those kids that are what I call in the middle of the classroom, who will get school report cards that go, Jane is a fantastic student, she's contributing, she's interested, uh, she's wanting to learn, and she'll get a D, a C, a D, and a C. And we don't have any strategy in our educational system to actually identify those students and provide them with the resources they need to succeed. So we need education strategies that enable aspiration, support retention. Retention is important, but retention being at school is not enough. Uh, and improve outcomes, to particularly for those secondary school students who are at the top end of their curve, but way behind their non-Indigenous peers. And this is in particularly important if we're going to build an educational pathway from secondary school into university, which I think is part of the part of the issue that we're then confronting when we're coming to students are coming to university but they don't have the tertiary prep or the tertiary readiness. From the university end, uh, we need to ensure that Aboriginal participation is well supported by strategies that also focus on attainment and attend to those factors which impact on attrition. This includes issues of social inclusion, how well people are supported to be a part and feel a part of the university community, financial support and educational development. But again, higher education interventions need to be focused on improving outcomes at all points of the educational continuum. From my perspective, any student who comes to this university or to any university is a capable student and they need our attention whether they're just passing or they're doing much better because their educational platform hasn't been in place to give them that uh, 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 opportunity in their educational journey up till now. So we should aim to, but our aim is to support Indigenous students to finish their university with the best chances and the best opportunities that they, they can have to compete for the graduate jobs. And this means that we just can't be focused on students who we define as at risk alone. Having said that, we do need to absolutely attend to the issue of attrition. This is not a problem that is exclusive to Indigenous Australians. However, the social <coughs> harms are potentially far greater for those who don't have the social capital and no works to draw on if you leave university education without completion. Attrition is much more likely to uh, happen if you land at university without the tertiary prep that you need in order to succeed. There are a couple of issues that are really critically important in the in in the current environment but also in the new environment. Transition to university is critical and it's particularly in the first year that we really need to be mindful of the support, education and otherwise that we provide to uh, Indigenous students. Strategies need to be put in place to optimise the transition but strategies need to be focused on the whole length of the enrolling Indigenous cohort. By the time we know that students are at risk it's too late. We need to be intervening from March not in November, and we need to do that in a way that's focused on building the strengths of all our student cohort, not just though that group that we think are going to possibly be at risk. If the scholarship me measure in the federal budget uh, is to make an impact, these scholarships need to be well targeted. They need to be flexible so that each university can uh, design the delivery of, of to their particular uh, university cohort, and they need to be designed to enhance the educational uh, outcomes across the continuum of the target cohort. So we move away from just a narrow focus on uh, academic risk and financial risk to looking at ways in which we can support students to excel 
and support students to optimise uh, their outcomes. A redesigned higher education participation program uh, which provides the sector with secure funding and increased, um, uh, and increased autonomy to develop local solutions is welcome notwithstanding the proposed cuts in funding. But HEP needs to focus on Indigenous students as a priority, not as a subset of equity. Uh, a stronger focus on evidence-based educational interventions or building the evidence base will greatly enhance the ability to fine-tune strategies and to scale them up. Um, the deregulation of sub-bachelor load, and this is speaking to the university organ, uh, audience, and the related matters also creates an opportunity for the sector to, to address the issues of pathways for those students who finish year 12 but without the necessary readiness to succeed at university. <coughs> This package of uh, proposals may provide a more flexible pathway for some Indigenous students, provided, and this is absolutely provided, we get the quality issue right and there are strategies in place to en enable and support transition into uh, bachelor programs. So in the final bit, I want to talk, turn to the other key issue for me, so participation, ensuring we've got an environment to, for people to succeed, but also broadening the disciplines and the pathways uh, to the professions. Uh, Indigenous higher education completions are concentrated in a relatively small number of fields. And this is quite striking when you see it. Most completions are clustered in the society health field of study, in the education field and in the health field. However, when it comes to the other fields which have fallen off for some reason, um, so the big ones are the ones I've described. Everything else <laughs> is in the other group. Um, <laughs> uh, you just have to trust me on that. Uh, it includes uh, disciplines uh, such as uh, commerce, uh, business degrees, uh, information computing, uh, technology. Now this has an impact on the distribution of employment and our, and our engagement as Indigenous Australians in the broader economy. For example, Indigenous Australians are very poorly represented in employment in the information and media and communications field and in the financial insurance services sector. And yet these are fields that are gonna grow in the next 20 years. So we need to be in place in, with the degrees to actually enter into information, communication, technology and the financial services, yet it's not represented in the fields of study. So efforts by the university sector are also critical to ensuring uh, that not only do we enable the best outcomes and people moving into professional pathways, but we're moving across the disciplines and not clustered uh, in a relatively small subset of those of opportunity in university. So this brings me back to the challenge uh, that I started with. How do we build a cohort of Indigenous engineers as just one thought piece of the challenge? It, if we can think this through and think through what the issues are, we can actually find a way to significantly, not entirely, but significantly broaden the access across the university disciplines. For this to occur, there is two fundamental things that need to happen. We must absolutely address the pressing challenge of increasing the number of Indigenous secondary school students in science, technology, engineering and maths courses. When we survey uh, through programs such as PISA, uh, outcomes in science, literacy, we know there's a big gap in terms of Indigenous outcomes in the sciences. There's not a gap in interest. Indigenous students across Australia are slightly more interested in science than their non-Indigenous peers, and yet we're failing to capitalise on that interest. About 63% of the gap is because of reading. But the other thing that uh, is also disturbing when we look at the literature, that in terms of science engagement, engagement being that sense of, I as a person see myself as a scientist, I'm attracted to science and I see myself in the career of science. What we do know is the case for Aboriginal students here in Australia, but also Maori students, that nothing in the classroom is engaging them in science. The things that engage Aboriginal kids in science is what happens at home, what happens in their community life, but it's not in the classroom. So this points me to, I guess, the, the real challenge is an educational delivery challenge. 
we need to ensure that uh, Aboriginal kids and, ki more, and um, more generally those kids in regional and remote Australia have opportunities to be taught by their discipline, by teachers working in their discipline, uh, have the hours in the classroom and the, pe the educational or the teaching strategies that actually facilitate and encourage their interests in science. If we can solve the science problem, we can open up the whole university to Indigenous Australians. Not an entire, not the whole university, but much more than what we're doing at the moment. It is the rate limiting uh, step in terms of engineering. It is the rate limiting step in terms of maths, in terms of commerce. It is the rate limiting step in all the applied science, disciplines, pet science, and so on. So this is the big challenge for us uh, in thinking through educational strategy across Australia. The second is that we need an organisational environment in which the prioritisation or the focus on Indigenous education is driven at a faculty and discipline level, level rather than just across the whole university. This was a critical factor in cha for change in relationship to medical education. However, the deans of medicine did not lead this change alone. The professional bodies, the industry and the policy environment were critical to creating that social context. In other words, uh, deans of medicine couldn't move because the Royal Australian College of Physicians said this is a priority. The Royal Australian College of General Practitioners said this is a priority. The Australian Health Industry through the Commonwealth Department of Health said to the deans of medicine this is a priority. And then we had the Australian Indigenous Doctors Association saying this is a priority. It creates an environment where the people that are most key to setting the context of what's happening in their, in their discipline, in their field, actually need to take leadership. And we had a, a pivotal moment, uh, I think about 10 years ago, where we took all the deans, uh, uh, all those who would come actually, uh, into, into, a, into a, a place where they couldn't escape and said, you need to provide leadership on this. We cannot take this further without your leadership. And it's similar to what we're looking for in terms of the deans of engineering. We're saying to the deans of engineering, you need to own this problem. You need to look at the issue of pathways. You need to look at the issues of the educational environment and you need to lead change. The Indigenous graduates in engineering will be there. The industry will be there and the professional bodies will also be there. But you ultimately need to take responsibility and accountability. So these are the two things that are critical to broadening access. Uh, two of the key things, uh, science and science education and getting faculties to take leadership. Having said all that, the biggest barrier to change in the Aboriginal context is the paralysis that happens when we assume that Aboriginal disadvantage is inevitable. Yet we're a long way from the days back in 1959 when a young Aboriginal woman, Margaret Weir, who grad, uh, graduated from this university with a diploma of physical education. Margot had begun her tertiary education in another university in Queensland. But after a difficult and challenging experience, she had a second time, and this time successful, attempt here at this university. For this time, she was welcomed by a number of supporters, including the then Women's College, who provided her with some scholarship support. Although she was later to go on to create a doctoral degree, she attended our annual welcome for Indigenous students this year, proudly claiming this university as her alma mater. Hers was a significant achievement, and as was um, Charles Perkins, who similarly showed incredible fortitude and toughness and resilience when he graduated at the University of Sydney a few years later. And this marked the beginning of a now flourishing Aboriginal presence in the Australian university system. But although we've come a long way from the time when Aboriginal success was a remarkable curiosity, we still have a long way to go. But this is the face of success. What matters now is to ensure that higher education is central to the Indigenous policy agenda and that our strategies are aligned to ensuring a focus on quality, excellence, and the best outcomes across the entire breadth of opportunity that a university uh, provides. 
we will not achieve the best outcomes without realigning Indigenous education strategy across the whole continuum from early childhood uh, through to the secondary school system. But in this new policy environment, we need to be doubly certain that the measures are put in place to shore up this momentum for change. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to make some remarks at the end of Ian's lecture um, field. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging uh, Kulam Nation, and this is uh, Wurundjeri country, and celebrating that fact. Um, if you're really, really lucky in your professional life, um, there are really good people who come into your life and then they come back into your life and then they come back into your life again. And um, one of the sensational standouts for me is Ian Anderson. There is someone here I've known even longer than Ian and I want to acknowledge too, and that's um, Professor Langton over there. Um, I first met Marcia in the late 1970s when I found her helping out with um, a demonstration being organised by well-meaning students for the homeless with a particularly rat in uninspiring bunch of posters. And Marcia got down on her knees and painted this beautiful, beautiful banner. And I thought, my God, um, she can even paint. Um, <laughs> and Marcia has come back in and out of my life as I become uh, more personally engaged in the question of Indigenous um, progress. Um, so it's sort of a double honour to have you both here um, tonight. Um, so Ian first came into my life in 1995 when um, I was asked to lead the Commonwealth's um, Indigenous Health Program, which had been moved, if you remember the history, just then out of uh, ATSIC and into the Health Department, Nehemiah kind of health financing bureaucrat who was suddenly thrust into this um, incredibly challenging kind of um, world. And uh, one of the people I met early on, surrounded by this incredibly intense swirl of kind of political focus that bureaucrats just absolutely eschew and kind of run from, um, was this incredibly brilliant, incredibly young um, doctor from the Fitzroy Health Service, um, who just kind of intrigued me with uh, his wit. Uh, and uh, um, I remember um, him telling me this story when I said, it's, you know, sort of Fitzroy. And he said, yeah, 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 but don't do that thing referred to uh, uh, unnamed senior kind of medical person in Melbourne who, upon meeting Ian and discovering his uh, provenance, asked him, so that'd be Fitzroy in the Kimberley, right? Um, um, and I remember ringing in once when early on in my time, we're kind of travelling around Australia making connection, trying to sort of sell this notion that the health department was now responsible for something which had been defined in community a lot by community-owned services. And I found my... So we'd gone a lot to remote places and then somebody suggested to me rather forcefully that I spend some time in rural New South Wales. And I found myself one night in a town called Wellington near Dubbo and was just, I came, you know, early career in the welfare sector, had come out and just seen, you know, um, teenage mums everywhere, uh, young people um, on the nod, um, just desperate welfare dependence and poverty and uh, kind of desperation and ringing Ian and Ian saying, uh, welcome to the real Aboriginal Australia, mate. Um, you know, time you saw this. Um, so Ian came to work with us in Canberra and became in many ways, I think, you know, the most important force in that Office of Aboriginal Health. Um, and I remember some things about that time which mean for me, my reading of tonight's lecture is it's an outpoint of 20 years of work. It's not the outcome of a last couple of years of intense thinking about Indigenous higher education. So 
Ian arrives and just insists that we start paying attention to the evidence. If it's going to be a health department, we're well, going to pay attention to the evidence and um, start insisting we actually focus on health problems and the epidemiology and the data. Um, and insisted that we pay attention to the development of the Indigenous medical profession. So that's like nearly 20 years ago, and that was the genesis of the Indigenous Doctors Association, which it was um, not, not hard to convince the then, our then minister or me that that needed to be done, um, but that was a radical idea then. You know, the community leadership was not convinced that the burgeoning of a professional class of Aboriginal doctors was what the country needed, even though we were 100 years behind the Kiwis in that endeavour. Um, so this is a man who's always had the courage of evidence and always had the courage quietly to resist the pro progressivist dogma of the day and quietly to forge ahead with the things that will really make a difference. So fast forward 18 years. In fact, we've stayed in touch. This isn't a completely objective or impartial appraisal you're getting here. Um, um, but fast forward 18 years, and Ian's at the University of Melbourne. He's no longer uh, the public health academic. He's actually turned his um, significant intellectual power to thinking through the challenge of Indigenous professionalism across the economy, not just in the health world, where by then real goals are starting to be kicked. Not, not adequate, and even parity at first year intake is still away from where we need to be. But, um, and we start down the road of the review that Ian referred to, um, and who's going to ask the hard questions? You know, who's going to raise the difficult questions? Are grants programs and whole of campus support services the answer? Or could they actually in some cases be part of the problem? You know, or is it actually getting the deans, the, fac the faculties and behind them the professions to drive the change? Um, the appalling kind of figures about uh, STEM results um, and Ian referred to them again tonight with um, power. Um, and so uh, he did the translation for us. You know, the public health intellectual will always point out that it's not compressing the curve that's the answer, it's shifting the curve. And the, um, the appalling, the, the uh, terrible consequences of focusing only on compressing the bottom of the curve when the creation of the professional class requires extending the top of the curve to parity. Um, um, so again, that preparedness to step outside the comfortable, kind of warm feeling um, orthodoxy. And then, and that's what Ian's done again tonight. So uh, the government that I uh, proudly work for um, has an ambitious reform agenda for higher education. And uh, uh, I've spent quite a lot of time on the road in the last couple of months and would be aware there are just one or two issues where people have some um, sort of issues that they want to litigate with the government and we have a parliament and it will um, be debated there. Um, uh, and it would be tempting to stop at those debates. Um, but as Ian points out, um, there's a very high likelihood that some substantive part of this reform agenda will pass the parliament. Uh, the minister himself has signalled that he expects to have to deal to get that done, and there may be some parts change as well. Um, but that's not where Ian stops. Ian says, let's imagine a world which is substantially deregulated and where market forces and much more autonomy for universities are the defining factors of the system, at least in the teaching and learning space. What does that then mean for equity practice? And some of those hard questions that he was part of asking in the review we did um, come into focus. And, um, and I thought tonight's lecture kind of well, set a uh, bracing agenda for me. Um, 
you know, the focus on, well, we don't have any evidence. We need to watch. When does debt sensitivity become an issue? Major review of um, continuous and discontinuous change countries commissioned in the EU last year um, said you've got to look at the debt uh, at the loan system. That's that's the key answer, and that of course has been one of the debating points about the current reform proposal. But Ian puts that one on the table and says you've got to watch that. Um, the question of social capital, you know that. Um, that the young people we're talking about aren't buttressed uh, with confidence in the same way. And how, how do equity practitioners actually do that and draw uh, the corporate sector uh, and the heartland of universities into that process? The question of completion, the powerful point that Ian makes about the damage that non-completion does. There's, it's not acceptable to say, oh, well, we got a lot in, but we didn't get them out. Ian was the one who pointed out to me there are three groups of universities in this country. There are those enrolling a lot of Indigenous students but not graduating them. There are those not enrolling very many but graduating a high number. And then there's, unfortunately, um, a minority who managed to do both. Um, and so that's a really interesting question. Why? why? Why that difference? And Ian points to the case of the mature age student and the different life lived and responsibilities. Um, and he points to the lack of preparedness of year 12 students, uh, grade the, the school leaver cohort, and sets some real challenges, not just for us in terms of how we remake the HEP funding pot uh, and stick to our guns on the university-driven nature of the scholarship scheme that's proposed, but to universities. You know, the, the zeitgeist of the current reform is government stops driving this stuff because the bureaucrats don't know best here, but, <coughs> but that universities do. And that's a really big challenge he puts up. And then he comes back to the fundamental. Well, big progress in medicine, still a long way to go. Bigger way to go everywhere else. Um, and. You know, um, Craig Ritchie's here, my colleague, who's responsible for the branch in the department that works with Ian and his committee. Um, and it, we, I remember having a conversation earlier in the year, the three of us, we were trying to work out, you know, what's the catchphrase for Craig's mission? Um, and my catchphrase would be, and I think it was reinforced tonight, is supporting the emergence of a professional class, uh, and dare I say it, a capitalist class from Indigenous people of Australia. Um, um, I remember, I Ian finished with a great story, I'll finish with a story. I remember being in Darwin, I'd just gone to Darwin, I had a period running the health department up there, um, and there was this great African doctor who just arrived at the Menzies School of Health Research. Um, and he kind of walked around for a while, and then he started saying things like, where I come from in post-colonial Africa, that black people want to be the doctors and the judges and the teachers. Uh, why are the black people here not kind of insisting on owning the professions? And of course, in the politics of these things, that's pretty hard. And he got kind of taken out the back and kind of roughed up a bit. But Ian puts that question kind of right in the centre. Um, and he insists that we all step up to it. And, you know, I celebrate that. So it's my pleasure to kind of move a vote of thanks to Ian for continuing this at least 20 year. I've only been part of it for 20 years. You've been doing it for a lot longer. Um, but continuing this um, truth-telling, light-shining, insistent uh, kind of quest for answers and action from all of us here, and I think we all really appreciate that. So I want to move that vote of thanks. And then on Field's behalf, I think I want you to all come to the bar where I think Field is shouting, including <laughs> Lemonade for those from our comments. So thank you, Ian. We really appreciate it.